All right, so Leah is with us today as the Community, Community Crisis Center. <laughs> she is their Director of Crisis Response Services. So she oversees the Mobile Crisis Response and Guidelines Center Triage Counseling Programs. That's a lot in your title, Leah. <laughs> Leah received her MSW from the University of Iowa and has nearly 20 years of administrative experience in healthcare and higher ed. Leah is also an applied suicide intervention skills trainer and provides individual counseling and therapy at Tanager Place's Coralville location. So welcome, Leah, and you can take it away. Hi there. Thank you so much, Ellie. I'm really excited to be here today with everyone. Um, and my uh, audio is still okay, Ellie. Everything sound good? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, my name is Leah Gelson Moreland. I am with, I'm the Director of Crisis Response Services at Community. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about professional mental health awareness. And so for our purposes today, um, I'm really just going to, you know, sort of review um, some things you all can do if your clients, colleagues, peers, um, any of the folks that you work with in your jobs um, appear to be having a mental health crisis. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to identify that. And um, we're gonna talk a little bit about the difference bet between um, escalation and crisis um, because they are two different things um, and sort of how to tackle those things. And then um, at the end of the presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how you can take care of yourselves. So um, I'll just um, I'll just kind of start going through my slides here. And I do have a sort of a learning objective slide in here too. So we'll review that again. So you all can kind of get a handle on, on what's, what's coming up. So um, first, I'm just going to talk a little bit about me. I'm so sorry. I'm there we go. Okay. So <laughs> I'm just gonna talk a little bit about me. So um this is my <laughs> my professional headshot here. Um and so I like we talked about already, I'm the director of crisis response services at community crisis services. So I oversee mobile crisis response. So our mobile crisis response counselors are available in Johnson and Iowa counties. Um, they're available 24-7, 365, um, and they go out to people in person when people are experiencing crises, um, so they can be dispatched um, in person. So um, we have a youth mobile crisis response program. So we have youth mobile crisis response counselors that respond to 11 different school districts. So um, a lot of districts there. Um, some of them are even out a little bit outside of our service area, our actual service area. So it's got a lot of schools that we're responding to. Um, youth mental health um, crises are are on the rise, so this is something that we're 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 really in tune with right now. Um, we also have a law enforcement liaison program that I oversee. Our law enforcement liaisons are crisis counselors. They're trained crisis counselors who dispatch with law enforcement officers. So um, that way, uh, the real goal of our program is jail and hospital diversion. So when we send crisis counselors out with law enforcement officers, we're hopefully able to divert folks from ending up in jail or the hospital um, when really they just need some on-site crisis counseling or some resourcing. Um, and then I also oversee the GuideLink Access Center triage counseling program. So um, GuideLink is a new access center. It's, been, it's about two years old. It's on Southgate Avenue here in town. Um, and when you go into GuideLink, you're imme immediately assessed by crisis counselors, and they're called our triage counseling team, and I um, oversee them as well. So um, lots of lots of good work um, in crisis services, and, and I'm really excited and proud to be a part of that. Um, I have my MSW from the University of Iowa. I'm licensed as an LMSW in the state of Iowa. I'm working toward my clinical licensure, and that's why I provide that individual therapy at Tanager Place's Coralville location. Um, I see 13-year-olds on up. So um, I have approximately five years of crisis counseling and suicide intervention experience. I was, of course, a crisis counselor before I did, before I took this role as the director. Um, and I also used to take calls on the National Suicide Hotline. 
Um, I'm a, as Ellie mentioned, I'm a certified trainer in applied suicide intervention skills training. Um, I've about 20 years of administrative experience. Most of that is in healthcare and some of that is in um, higher education. I have lived in Iowa City for 25 years. I am also, I'm married to another social worker who's also a therapist. Um, we have two sons and both of our kiddos are, are neurodivergent. So that is a population um, that is particularly important to me as well. So um, that's just a little bit about me before I get started today um, with you all talking about professional mental health awareness. So um, here's a little outline of what we're going to go over today. So um, first, we're going to talk about what a crisis is. Um, you know, we're going to talk about sort of the formal definition of a crisis, but we're also going to talk about how those of us who work in crisis services um, view crises uh, broadly. Um, we're going to talk about how to identify a crisis in, in colleagues or clients. Um, we're going to talk about tips and strategies for de-escalation and and crisis, um, crises, pardon me here, crisis response, there we go, sorry, um, and then uh, we're going to talk about the difference there between um, escalation and crisis um, during that section. I'm going to help sort of identify resources, and then we're going to talk a little bit about tending to yourselves, especially um, on the heels of, you know, helping someone else through a crisis. Um, and then I'll, and then there's room here for questions, but of course I'll take questions at any time. And I want to open that up now. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. All right. I'll jump right in here. Um, so what is a crisis? Um, so I'm going to, so this here, our first bullet point here, um, is kind of the Webster's Dictionary um, sort of formal definition of a crisis, which is a time of intense difficulty, trouble, or danger. Um, now, because all people are different and they have different coping skills, stress responses, um, people have different um, environments that they're working within, both work, um, both professional and personal. Um, and because of all those differences in people, um, a crisis can look really different for each individual. So um, what this starts to look like when you start thinking about your peers, your colleagues, your clients in terms of like whether or not they're experiencing a crisis is it starts to look like you sort of taking stock and um, just sort of having a, you know, kind of doing a general assessment of that person um, within the context of your understanding of them. So your ability to think critically, to follow your instinct, and to sort of like look back on your previous experiences with this person, if you've had any, and sort of use those to guide you is what's going to allow you to identify a crisis. Um, with, you know, as someone is experiencing it. So the reason I say all of that is because when we talk about crisis, crises, um, they're relative, right? So what is a crisis for me is not necessarily going to be a crisis for Ellie and so on and so forth, um, because we're different people. And so um, I tell people this from time to time when I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about defining a crisis, and that is that, you know, when I used to work on the National Suicide Hotline, we would get crisis calls as well. And so, um, you know, I think probably the least, the, the lowest stakes call I ever got, like in the grand scheme of things, was someone who got a bill in the mail, and that bill that they had received in the mail did not match uh, the bill the way it looked online. And that was really upsetting to them. Um, and it was it was enough of a crisis for them that they called a crisis line. And now certainly there were probably other things going on in that person's life, um, other, other issues they were having to deal with. There may have been additional mental health diagnoses in place, but the reality was is that that thing, that moment, you know, that difference between what was on that piece of paper and what was on the computer screen constituted a crisis for that person. Now, again, on the same phone line, some of the highest stakes calls that I received were related to active suicidal ideation. You know, people were actively attempting to um, complete suicide. And so, you know, that that range between like 
the bill in the mail that's really confusing and like actively wanting to end one's life is really, really big. It's really broad. So, um, you know, we really let people define their own crisis. And that's when we hear in a community, when we do our crisis response services, that's, you know, one of our core philosophies is that we don't define crises for people. We let people define their own crisis. Um, And for your purposes, when you're talking with, again, clients, colleagues, peers, um, that means if someone tells you that something is wrong, you want to treat them as though something is wrong um, and and hear that from them, hear that information and explore that a little bit um, with them. Um, If you're unsure about whether or not someone is experiencing a crisis, you can simply ask, are you okay? Um, And the thing about the word crisis is that the word itself is really scary to people. And so you don't have to use that word with the people you're talking to, but you can think about it that way in your head um, for the purposes of the the skills I'm going to review later. Um, Because if you think about what someone is going through as a legitimate crisis, um, then you can tend to that thing, you know, as though it is with with the appropriate skills. And so um, the final thing I want to say here is that at Community, we are a voluntary service. So we only go out to people if they want us to, you know, if they ask us to. Um, And so even, even we as professionals are operating according to individual preference and individual definition. So if someone calls and says, I am experiencing a crisis, like I'm having trouble and I need help, Um, then, then they've asked for help and we, and we go to them. So, um, so for you all, I mean, there are going to be situations where people will ask you for help. They'll say, I'm, I I really need some help. You know, this is, I'm having a troubling time. Um, And then there are going to be situations where, um, you know, you'll see someone maybe not acting themselves. You'll, you'll see that they're, um, they might be struggling with something. And that's when you can broach that topic with them and say, are you okay? Um, you know, people aren't always going to tell you, but, um, but we, we firmly believe in, in receiving the people, the information people give us about themselves and, and, um, you know, dealing with that information appropriately. Um, sorry, I just lost my mouse here. I've got one of those situations where I have a whole bunch of screens. Um, okay. So, um, so I'm going to go through some of the situations that we see at community that might constitute a crisis, but I have a little disclaimer here at the end because again, crises are relative, right? So um, crisis situations that could come up for anybody, suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation, um, depression, anxiety, panic. Um, and so panic is, you know, again, separate from, um, from anxiety, but people have, have, but they can be certainly linked and people have panic episodes frequently. And sometimes panic is a response to a crisis. Um, worry about a spouse or a child, concerns about work, loss of a pet, loved one, friend, any kind of grief, loss of a job, loss of a, um, you know, loss of a home. Um, those are all, all reasons for for folks to experience a crisis, Um, legal challenges, housing challenges. Um, We see that a lot in our work where people are just contending with the loss of, you know, basic needs. They just don't have the things they need um, to live, you know, according to, you know, Maslow's hierarchy, like they're without a home or food. Um, So, uh, witness to an assault. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this at the end, but like how witnessing something or experiencing, um, a crisis sort of, um, peripherally or as a supporter of, of, of someone who is, who is one of the primary folks experiencing the crisis, kind of that, um, secondary experience is also a, can be a crisis. Um, So survivor of an assault, self-harm, victim of bullying, chronic pain, chronic illness, uh, new baby at home, super exciting and fun life events that sometimes lead people to experience a lot of stress, Um, substance use. And then here's my disclaimer, literally anything else you can think of. So um, again, this is where that whole, you know, relative um, piece comes into play. You know, these are some of the things we've seen. We've also seen a lot more and um, 
and it could be anything additional. Um, so here, okay. So again, the same with crisis symptoms. If somebody is, um, you know, having some mental health trouble, you know, they can be sad, angry, silent, loud, um, sweating, pacing. They can have a flat affect and a motive affect. Um, they can functional life performance, like they can be operating functionally and still experiencing some mental health challenges or a crisis, um, escalation and, and many, many other symptoms. So again, I know this is like challenging because, you know, it's hard to sort of really focus in and say specifically, this thing is an indicator of a mental health challenge or a crisis, but it's different for everyone because people are different. So um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about escalation here, because I feel like this is an important thing to note when we're talking about crises and about mental health challenges. So if someone is experiencing sort of an acute crisis, um, escalation can be a part of that. Now, cr having a crisis or a mental health challenge does not mean that the person is going to escalate. Um, but they could. And so I just want to talk a little bit about escalation um, because with escalation, if someone escalates, you, you know, typically what we do and, and what you would want to try to do is to de-escalate them before kind of walking through, um, the, the sort of the basic crisis, um, response skills that I'm going to talk about here in a couple of minutes. So, Okay. Escalation. And so this is when someone's ability to soothe or calm their own emotions or reactions is unavailable to them. So um, these are the ways it can present lack of control. Um, you know, someone's unable to ground themselves, um, lack of validation. Uh, they feel isolated and misunderstood or um, a sensory input need or sensory overwhelm. So this is one of those things where it's a layer, right, that ex that can exist prior to somebody being able to actually engage in a conversation about the crisis itself. And so when someone escalates, we want to try to tackle that layer. We want to try to de-escalate so that we can start talking about the crisis. Now, again, you know, the crisis can become so overwhelming that the person escalates. So they, these two things can be, um, they can be linked, they can dovetail. Um, but just because someone is having a mental health challenge or a crisis doesn't mean they're going to escalate. So I hope that makes sense. And if it doesn't, please feel free to, to let me know. Um, and I can, I can review that a little bit further. Um, Okay, so when we talk about de-escalation, um, what we want to do here is we want to take, you know, sort of three, these three steps here. Um, what it is, is it is using tools and skills to help a person interrupt the process of building toward a crisis peak. So that's what we call um, when someone peaks in during escalation, which is just another layer that makes it more confusing to talk about these two things in tandem. But um, but this is this is what de-escalation is. The, some considerations to take when you're de-escalating someone are to, and these are also considerations to take when you're talking someone through, you know, a mental health crisis or uh, or a mental yeah a mental health crisis, excuse me, or a challenge, is to remember to reflect a little bit and to understand your own triggers and biases um, so that you can set them aside and build rapport with the person. Uh, we often talk about the fact that we don't have to agree with someone to validate their feelings, right? And this is sort of um, part of empathy work too, is that, um, you know, we don't have to tell someone that they're you know, if they have uh, deeply uh, ethically misaligned ideas or ideals with us, we don't have to say, oh, yes, I absolutely agree with you. Um, but typically their feelings in these moments are not necessarily connected to those things, you know, feeling isolated, feeling misunderstood, um, feeling like no one is, is hearing you. Um, those exist separately from from someone's, you know, typically someone's thoughts about, you know, or personal ethics and values. So, um, so we can 
identify with them. We can validate them without agreeing with those things. Um, so you want to separate yourself from the idea that you can control what's happening. So that's another big part of it. And that also, also applies to crisis work is that we're not trying to control things with the folks we're, we're talking to. Um, we're just trying to hear them. Um, and so the final thing here, and this is what our uh, one of our trainers, Jake, likes to say, is that you become an anchor of calm um, for the person. So, and and really we mean that, you know, you're sort of sort of trying to kind of stop the boat from floating away and to, you know, just be that calm presence in the room with that person. Um, some of the skills that can contribute to de-escalation here, you want to take a deep breath. Just take that deep breath before you start. Appear calm, centered, and self-assured, even if you don't feel it. Uh, the thing we often talk about with escalation, with crisis work, with mental health challenges, is that if someone is escalated, if someone is contending with their own big emotions in a moment, um, you know, complementing their feelings, like if they are escalated and you remain calm, that is something that's incredibly soothing to them in that moment. Um, use a low monotonous tone of voice. Use short, simple questions and statements. So this is where um, just trying to um, help someone give you a little bit more information. You don't want to confuse someone in a moment of escalation. Um, know that you might want to freeze, fight, or flee. Like your sympathetic nervous system might get going in these moments. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to feel those things. Um, you know, again, you want to try to remain calm, um, but being aware that those, um, those feelings might come up for you is, is half the battle. Like if you know they're coming and you can sort of prepare yourself for those, um, then, then you will just be better, better equipped. So, um, okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit here about crisis response. And so this is um, we, this is what we call this. We call this crisis response. This is, um, this is kind of the core of, um, what our crisis response counselors are doing, but these are very simple steps. Anybody can do them and they're rooted in mo motivational interviewing. So if that's, um, if that's a skill that you all know of, or, um, are familiar with, then these are going to sound really familiar to you. Um, and motivational interviewing is something that anybody can do. And, um, and so this is not, um, I'm not getting too in the weeds here. These are just some, some basic steps you can take um, in these moments. Now, again, we're back to crisis response. So this is not, we're not de-escalating someone. We're, we're really having that conversation with somebody. If they're having a mental health challenge or um, a crisis um, that you can use these skills when you're talking to your colleagues, you can use them when you're talking to um, your employees, folks that, that report directly to you. You can use these skills when you're talking to folks who you report to um, and clients and uh, peers, anyone else um, that you're engaging with. These, um, these skills are not specific to any person or population. So, so we're going to start with empathy. So um, if you are, I've, I've, what I've included here is the empathy stem. So the reason I've included this here is because there's a lot of discussion about empathy, always, always, um, and about how important it is. And it is. Um, but if something that comes up for you frequently is how do I communicate empathy to somebody else? Like you can feel it. I know I'm empathizing, but how do I communicate that empathy? Um, and the way that you do that is by using the empathy stem. And what this, and that sound, it, the empathy stem is, it sounds like you're feeling blank because of blank. And so what you're doing there is you're correctly identifying someone's emotion in that moment based on the situation that they have described to you. And what that does is it makes that person feel heard. It makes them feel seen in this moment when they're having a really hard time. And so that is, that's how you can convey that to somebody. Um, this is one of the first skills that we, that we teach folks here. Um, and we teach this because it's sort of one of those like easy, basic ways to convey this, this sort of 
I think, um, nebulous thing, you know, that we often talk about. Um, and so this is like, this is the root, the root of all crisis response right here. Um, but this is also really helpful in any conversation. I, I manage a lot of, a lot of people in my job and I use this, this empathy statement very frequently. Um, so I think this is, yeah, just something to, to kind of like file away there for you. Um, the next piece here is active listening. So when we talk about active listening, listening, what we truly mean is like showing the person you're talking to that you are actively listening to them. And so that's more of a, a visual thing. Um, I mean, there are other active, active listening skills that get a little deeper than that. But for these purposes, this is all you need to do. Um, you can face the person who is experiencing the crisis, nod, you know, when they're talking to you, let them know that you're hearing them, make that good eye contact, um, use minimal encouragers. You could say, uh-huh, sure, I see, um, that's understandable. Oh, wow, oh how, oh, how hard, you know, things like that. Let them know that you're hearing what they're saying and then just listen. Um, at this point in the conversation, typically people really want to solve um, and can just avoid that impulse. Like that's not necessarily here to solve the problems. We're just here to, to listen at this point in time. Um, I'm going to move on to my next step here, but I want it. There's a little bit of um, noise feedback here in the office. Is that something that you all can hear that's getting in the way of what I'm okay? No, you're good. All right. Perfect. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> um, um, okay. So the next step here is reflection. So reflection isn't like fact gathering. It's not, you're not trying to sort of like get the facts of the case. Again, we're not, this isn't about solving at this point in time. Um, you're not trying to prove something. And this can be hard too, because people are going to give you, once you've established rapport and once they feel comfortable with you, people are going to give you um, their account of a certain situation from their own perspective. And your job is to take that information and to hold it. And not to try to prove anything, um, and not to say, oh, well, are you sure that's really what that person meant? Because it doesn't sound like that's something that, you know, what that's not what we're doing here is not proving anything to this person. We're just taking the information that they're giving us. Um, so your job here is simply to confirm your understanding of what you've heard. And that's super easy. All you, all you really need to do in this moment is to repeat back what the person has said to you. You can say, what I'm hearing you say is that you're really angry because, you know, you just went through a breakup and your, your ex-partner took your dog, you know, something like that. And then you can say, does that sound right? Do I have that right? And most of the time, what's going to happen is that person that you're talking to is going to say, oh my God, yes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, being heard is, is half the battle. So um, the fourth step here is validation. And again, this is validation is really kind of part and parcel of the other steps here. So it's not, I, I put it as a, as a separate step here, but it's, um, it's kind of, it's kind of woven throughout all of this, um, which again, is that you don't have to agree with someone to validate what they've said. Um, your goal here is to indicate that their feelings are legitimate and authentic. So saying things like, I'm really, you know, I'm sorry that happened. It's okay to say you're sorry something happened. Like, I know we go back and forth about whether or not it's okay to say you're sorry to people. It's okay. Um, if it's genuine and authentic, that's all that it needs to be. Um, because that's the other piece of this is that like when people are in crisis, they're highly attuned to your BS level. And so like you really, really, really want to be as, as genuine and authentic as possible. And sometimes that's, sometimes that's you saying, you know, I'm not totally sure what to do right now, but I'm here for you and I will help you figure it out. Um, and that's okay. That's totally okay. Um, but again, you don't have to agree with the person. You can say like, that sounds really hard. I'm so sorry that happened. That sounds like that was really challenging for you. Those are not, um, you're not agreeing with someone. You're just validating what they're feeling. Um, all right. 
Okay. So those are the basic steps of, of kind of crisis response there. Um, when you've gone through those steps and what we tell people here all the time, and, and this is the reality of it, is that like, sometimes you'll do step one and then you'll go to step three and then maybe you'll head back to step two. Um, and, and that's okay. None of this really has to be in a specific order. Um, the other thing too, is that, you know, you'll probably go through all those steps like two or three times when someone is having a mental health challenge or a crisis and you're talking them through it. Um, people have lots of feelings that you'll identify and people have lots of things that they'll say that you'll reflect back to them. And there will be a lot of moments for validation. So that whole cycle can go on and on and on over and over. Um, but ultimately, you'll get to a point with that person where, you know, maybe it's time to look at some next steps. Maybe they want to start talking about solving their problem. And maybe that's something you can do with them right there. Maybe maybe it's someone you work with and you can start talking about ways to solve that problem. Um, maybe it is one of your clients and you can start talking about like, um, you know, what what's going on in their life? Do they are there gaps that need to be filled? Are there services in town that they don't have access to yet? And can you start brainstorming ways to to um, to gain access to those services? Um, you know, so that's and those are those are all perfectly fine steps. Um, but if that crisis continues and it feels really big and you you have gone through, you know, your steps and you've, you've validated and you've listened, um, but you're not quite sure what to do. Um, that's when you can turn to mobile crisis response. Um, and you can give us a call. Uh, mobile crisis response is again, uh, or MCR stands for mobile crisis response. Sorry. Um, again, local service through us at community, um, trained counselors are going to go anywhere in Johnson and Iowa County. 24-7, 365. It's free, confidential, non-judgmental. So um, our counselors have unmarked cars. Um, they're not going to show up with like a sandwich board on that says like, I'm here at a crisis council. You know, it's all very, very discreet and low key. Um, but they're also going to help, you know, sort of brainstorm next steps. Um, you know, there are lots of crisis related resources in the area, but um it's not any one person's job, you know, to know all of those, our, our crisis counselors do. And so um, they can sort of take, take that situation um, from you if it feels like it could, if it feels like that could be a good, a good next step. Um, another option is 988. So 988 is like 911 for mental health, um, except that you can, what's going to happen is you can talk on the phone to a, a trained crisis counselor. You can text with a trained crisis counselor from your phone, or you can chat from a computer. So this is, um, again, 24-7, 365, um, free, confidential, non-judgmental. The counselors on 988 aren't necessarily going to be located in your area. Um, there are lots of 988 hubs all over the country. And so, um, uh, but they'll certainly help you resource within your area to the best of their ability. Um, this service is ideal for people who um, appreciate a certain level of anonymity. Anonymity. They don't, they don't want counselors showing up at their house. They really just want to like maybe talk to somebody on the phone or chat with somebody about what's going on with them. Um, another option here is a healthcare provider. So I'm going to be very honest and transparent with you and say, again, that community is dedicated to um, uh, diversion. So we're always trying to divert from jail or a hospital. Um, we find that in most cases, truly, folks can be um, de-escalated and provided um, crisis counseling and resources right where they are, whether that be their home, their office, park. Um, and typically it's better for someone's mental health not to remo remove them from a space in which they feel comfortable. Now, there are certainly situations where, you know, law enforcement needs to be called or someone needs to be taken to the hospital, but they are very few and far between. That said, um, you know, if you're in a situation where you're with a person, they're having a really tough time, they don't want anything to do with calling mobile crisis, they don't want 988, they certainly don't want law enforcement, you know, then in the interest of safety, you know, maybe the hospital or a healthcare provider is the best option. And that's okay. Um, 
So again, I put MCR on, MCR on here a second time as a referral source. And the reason I did this is because something that a lot of people don't know about our service is that if you call MCR, um, we have the service itself includes an incredibly robust follow-up, uh, which means that within 24 hours of that initial contact of those crisis counselors coming out um, to chat with somebody, that um, that person is going to get a call from our follow-up team. And again, those are also um, trained counselors who are calling and who are case managing. So um, they're checking in with that person. Are you okay? If the person is experiencing another crisis in that moment, then that person, then our follow-up team is going to crisis counsel them over the phone um, or potentially send out a team of counselors. If that person's crisis was caused by, again, like not being able to meet basic needs or not being able to meet other needs, like the need for a therapist, um, or, or a, a certain uh, phys a physician of a certain specialty, or you know, just anything additional. I mean, we our case managers have truly, truly helped people with everything you can imagine, and probably a lot of stuff you cannot imagine. So, um, so that's another part of the service that I just think is so worth mentioning and so important is that like we know that just because we've deescalated and talked someone through a crisis that. It, it's not, it's not going to disappear. Like those feelings don't just go away. And that most of the time um, folks can use some, some practical support as well. So um, okay. So that's kind of the bulk of what you can do for other people. Um, and so now I'm just going to move on to tending to yourself in these moments. And so the first thing I want to say that is that if you understand or if you assist someone through a crisis, like if that's what you have done that day, whether it be an employee and it was whether it be a crisis that you could solve in office or at work or at home, you know, um, or a crisis uh, that required you to call for uh, additional resources and assistance, either way. You have just assisted someone through something that was really challenging for them. And that is, can in and of itself be a crisis. So like, I, I feel like we need to normalize this idea that like helping someone through those moments is hard. Um, and, you know, we often, I think it's culturally, we feel like we should say, oh, it was no big deal. It was no problem. I, like, I was happy to help. And of course, all those things are true. You are happy to help that person. And um, it is a big deal. It's a big deal. And so a lot of the calls that we get are related to this in some way. People have friends or family or loved ones who are going through really rough times, who are having SI, um, and they need help themselves um, because they're being leaned on quite a bit and they're doing a lot of supporting and um, they don't have a lot of their own support. And so um, I just want to, I just want to acknowledge that um, it's okay if supporting someone has caused you, caused you to feel big emotions. And it's okay if those emotions are uncomfortable or lead you to have additional thoughts about yourself or your relationship with that person or anything existential. <laughs> um, these are all very real things. Um, so, you know, in that moment, it might be helpful, helpful for you to take some time to find a healthy way to process your feelings. So you can call MCR again, MCR counselors are, will come to you and you can say, I just, I just helped a friend or a family member or a colleague or a client through this really rough time. And it was really hard for me. Um, and that's something that they will totally understand and, um, talk you through completely non-judgmentally. Um, you can call 988, um, and talk to a counselor there or chat with a counselor, but you could also talk to a trusted friend, a therapist, a family member. Um, and just remember not to judge yourself for having like big feelings or responses to helping someone else. Um, and, and be, have compassion, have self-compassion. Um, you can utilize some mindfulness or panic reduction techniques. Um, I'm going to uh, give Ellie a little um, handout that I use sometimes um, that has some little sort of coping strategies on it um, for, you know, sort of like in the moment. And um, she'll make that available with the recording and you all can, can utilize that. Um, 
Create some space for yourself. Think through coping strategies that work well for you. You can even write them down for future use. We call this a coping plan. We use coping plans and crisis plans and safety plans with clients all the time because it can be really helpful to like write down all the things that are useful to you so that you can reuse them another time, you know, um, mental health challenges and crises don't exist like in a vacuum. Like these are things that can, um, recur. Um, and we want to acknowledge that that's a possibility and that that's also okay. And so like having a plan for yourself is completely reasonable. There are lots of, um, apps out there. Um, you can just, uh, search for coping plan apps, um, and just pull that together for yourself on your phone. If that makes it easier for you to access in those moments, when I do, um, therapy with teens and we talk through coping and safety, and a crisis plans, I often have them take a picture on their phone um, so that, you know, if they don't have an app, they still have the, the image on their phone and they can, they can refer to that pretty easily. Um, so tending to your, again, I'm going to go back to this, tending to yourself after you've supported someone else is super underrated. Um, the, the first step here as with most forays into self-compassion is awareness. So just like being aware of the fact that like you could have big feelings and it's okay to have big feelings. And it's, it's a really good idea to tend to yourself. Um, create space to process, feel your feelings, support yourself, learn to recognize your own triggers and physical and emotional responses to stress and anxiety. So we talked about this earlier when we were talking about de-escalation, recognizing your own triggers and biases, you know, recognizing your triggers in these moments, like, is there something that makes you particularly anxious? Is there something that really stresses you out? Um, we talk about this in a way that's sort of embarrassing. Like, oh, I have this trigger. Oh, this thing kind of triggers me. We don't like to talk about it. There's a lot of shame around them. And even the word triggers is, is a word that we don't love anymore, right? But the reality is that like understanding that something can be challenging to you in a given moment, um, is going to help you sort of acknowledge that and to set, you know, sometimes you're, sometimes it's possible to set boundaries up front so that you don't, so that either you don't have to deal with that or that you've kind of informed the person um, that you're with that that's, that's something that's really hard for you. Um, I'm going to be, I'll be very like vulnerable and real here and say that like one of my triggers I'm hearing impaired. And so um a trigger for me, especially in moments of like stress, like, you know, high stress moments, like if someone is in crisis is if anybody in the room talks so quietly that like, that I can't hear them anyway. And I especially can't hear them because I'm, I'm hearing impaired. And so, you know, that has caused me to um, be really upfront about my impairment and to say to people like, Hey, I'm hearing impaired. So I just make sure to speak up a little bit. Um, and if they don't do that, then to just sort of like give myself a little space around that, that like, Hey, it, it didn't work out. You still didn't hear this person. And it's okay that that's a little frustrating for you. Um, you know, kind of an inner monologue or a little inner, inner, um, phrase that I can use with myself in those moments. So, um, I just think it's important to recognize those things about ourselves and to, you know, not judge ourselves too harshly for them. Um, and the third thing I want to hear it say here too, is to give to yourself. Um, so after some, you know, after you tend to someone who's having a mental health challenge or a crisis, um, make sure to give to yourself, give, you know, a few moments for mindfulness, permission to enjoy passive receipt of stimuli. So if you want to sit and watch television or a movie, listen to an audiobook or a podcast, get a massage or a pedicure, something that doesn't require you to be productive, um, that is okay. Um, you can even do some gentle boundary setting around your time and energy. And that can help too. say, I just helped someone. It was really hard for me. I need, I need some time. I need a little space right now to sort of process that on my own. So, um, okay. Um, so the last thing I want to say here is for, uh, thank you all so much for your time today. Um, I want to just remember, just remind as we're kind of at the end here that everyone has experienced a crisis. So crises aren't, there aren't anything to feel shame around. Um, it's, you know, it can be hard to know what to do in any given moment if somebody's having a mental health challenge or a crisis, but it's okay. You know, these are things that happen, believe me, they happen all day, every day. Um, they're relative, again, because people are different. Um, 
And then everyone requires different things to feel safe and calm. And everyone deserves a compassionate, non-judgmental space to experience crises, to experience mental health challenges. Um, you know, those are things that, that I think it's, I, I feel passionately that it's, it's a basic human right um, to be able to, to have that space um, to experience big feelings. So, um, so yeah, I, if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, and I'm also happy to, um, I was telling Ellie too, like sometimes when I, um, have like do talks like this, people have very specific questions, <laughs> like maybe they've experienced something and they want to know what to do. And I just want to say that that's okay. Um, no identifying information, but please feel free to like talk about, um, anything specific if that's helpful for you. <clears throat> Well, I'll just jump in real quick. Hi, Leah. Can you Hi, hear me? Um, I just want to say I, one thing I appreciate. It's not really a question, but um, just getting that distinction between crisis and escalation. As someone who talks and thinks about this stuff kind of a lot, it's, I realized, God, I hadn't really um, thought about distinguishing crisis and escalation because they're really not the same thing. So I just wanted to let you know that was very valuable for me. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm happy to see you. <laughs> Hi, Leah. Oh, and it, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, go right Wait, ahead. I can lower, I can lower my hand now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, quick question. You mentioned, um, you mentioned not using the term or phrase triggered or triggering. Could you oh. uh, go into that a little deeper? That's the first time I've actually heard that. So I'm interested in learning. Oh, sure. I think primarily I use that phrase a lot and I think it's perfectly okay. I was, I was more so referring to like this idea that I think, I think we're at this place right now where like the word itself trigger is, um, I think, I think there's some, maybe even some judgment around using, using that word. And I think that's primarily because, um, we talk about it like, oh, that's triggering or, oh, a trigger warning, um, and things like that. And it, that's all valid. Like, yeah. I, I think trigger is one of those words that like should probably be used much more casually than it is. And by that, I mean much more broadly, like mm -hmm. it applies to a lot of things for a lot of people. And I think it's okay to, to use that word. And I think, um, sometimes, sometimes it gets referred to as sort of like a bad word or a word we should, you know, a word that's sort of like an eye roller, you know, but, um, but people have triggers. And um, I think it's like, I, I use the word pretty freely and I think it's okay to use that word. And I think sometimes where it comes up for me in terms of like talking about mental health challenges or crises is that we, we really, I think culturally want want to downplay all of this stuff because we don't want to appear weak and um, we don't want people to feel like they have to tend to us. And um, this is, this is all kind of wrapped up, I think, in a lot of, a lot of things. And, and there is, there are certainly uh, in my individual therapy work that I've seen some generational components to that too, um, or there can be. Um, and so I think that those two things go hand in hand, you know, like we don't want to, um, we don't want to call too much attention to ourselves when we're having like mental health challenges. Likewise, I think we don't want to say I have triggers because, you know, we don't, again, we want to downplay these things. It's not that big a deal. It's totally fine. I'm fine. But the reality is, is that like, if we talk about it and say like, I do have triggers, I have them. And, um, certain, certain things trigger me for various reasons. Um, then we can, you know, we can build space around those things and we can tend to ourselves and we can invite other people to tend to us. And, um, and we can sort of just normalize the fact that everyone has those things. And so uh, when I talk about it that way, that's really more kind of what I'm referring to. And I'm sorry if that was sort of confusing at that moment, but just that, like, I think, I think people don't love that word, but I think. Sure. It's, sure. It's no, I appreciate the ex <laughs> additional context. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, any other questions or thoughts? I have a question. Hi, thank you for your presentation, Hi, Leah. Yeah. I really like the distinction you made between like crisis response and like solving a crisis where it's like, 
the de-escalation has to happen before you can get to solving something, which yeah. I feel like I have tried to do those things at the same time in the past. Um, yeah. My question is like, what is a strategy when um, de-escalation isn't working? And mm -hmm. what do you do in that situation where they're not accepting empathy? They're not accepting um, a friend. So, yeah. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so when de-escalation doesn't work, um, I think the, the very best thing that you can do, and this is sort of like, this is nuanced, right? You sort of have to, um, you know, you sort of have to assess the details of, of the situation. Um, but something that I think is, is best in those moments for everyone is to just sort of say like, Hey, listen, like you can, you can talk about, you can talk about the, the elephant in the room, you know, you can say like, listen, I'm it like, sounds like you this, this isn't totally helpful to you, like what I'm doing here and that's okay. And so I just want you to know that, um, this is a safe space and this is, and you can sort of utilize this space in the way that's, that's, um, that's most useful to you, most valuable to you. Um, and so like at that point, allowing people space and time. Um, and again, like, I think sometimes when we're engaging with someone who is, having a crisis or mental health challenge, like we really want to get the thing solved and we want to dig right in and like take care of it. And, um, it, we're not, it's not our timeline. Right. And so I think that like, sometimes if we can just sort of say like, okay, like I get it. And, and maybe this isn't totally helpful. So let's just, we can just sit here. I can grab you a glass of water. Um, you know, you can just take some time and just breathe a little bit. Um, often I find, you know, that like when I do this in therapy, that just like allowing someone that space to sit for a little bit, that, if, you know, that that's really helpful for them and letting them know that there's not a clock on it. They don't have to like get back to normal within a certain amount of time. Um, you know, that, that I'm not judging the fact that they need time. Um, that that's all okay too. So I think, I think that that is, that is where I go when that, that doesn't work again, like this is all specific to the situation you're in, but if like, if safety is not, is a non-issue, there's not really like a high, high risk situation happening. Um, allowing that space can be really helpful. I think that's a good question. All right. Any other questions for Leah? Super. Well, thank you, Leah, so much. That was a lot of really great info. I will throw the recording up on our website, as well as the handout um, once Leah sends that over my way. So that'll be up on our website. I do have a couple of quick announcements for you all. We have a lot going on this summer here at the Community Foundation. So I want to share a couple of those things with you. First, our inclusive Johnson County Fund grant applications are open. So that's a new grant cycle this year specific to diversity, equity, inclusion work. That's on our website, also on our social media. Take a look at that. Um, those apps close at the end of the month. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. Take a look at that application. Um, and it is a very short application, so that's helpful too. We had our ed session today, obviously, but we have another one coming up here this summer. So take a look at that. That one is going to be um, August 9th around building capacity using AmeriCorps. So that's kind of our next ed session. We've got an Iowa Nonprofit Alliance launch happening here in May as well. So May 17th at 4.30 at the Stanley Museum of Art. We will be, um, It's we're just a piece of the puzzle. It's actually a new organization, a membership org for all nonprofits across the state of Iowa. And we're doing just a quick networking launch event um, to kind of share what that is and, and why we're involved. So join us there. That'd be great. And then our summer book club session is going to be June 22nd at Big Grove. So this one is a little bit different. We read the whole book and meet just once to chat um, in person. So take a look at that as well. All the details for all those events are on our website, or you can shoot me an email um, for more info. But Lots coming up. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for a few of those opportunities. Thanks all for helping on today. Have a lovely rest of your Wednesday.